was exactly 56 years ago tonight. Now, let's go to Wolf Blitzer. He's inside the debate hall. Wolf. Anderson, what a picture it will be when Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton step on the stage right behind us. This will be an endurance test. 90 minutes with no commercial breaks. Viewers will see Donald Trump uh, at the lectern on the left. This is the first time he's ever debated uh, against only one opponent. You'll see Hillary Clinton on the right of your screen. The moderator, NBC News anchor Lester Holt, he'll be seated in front of them. He'll ask the questions, try to keep the candidates to their times, and try to make sure the audience follows the no applause rule. Uh, Jake Tapper, the first few moments of this de debate could clearly set the tone for the debate. What are you looking for? I mean, what a night. First of all, these two have not met face to face during this election. I don't even know if they've been in the same room since Donald Trump married Melania Trump and invited the Clintons to his wedding. So the body language is going to be something that all of us are studying. Is it going to be friendly? Is it going to be gracious? Are they going to be nice to one another? It has been a very, very vicious battle. They have said very, very tough things about one another. Also, Wolf, keep in mind, those in this auditorium, unlike some of the previous debates that we saw during the primaries and caucuses, are going to be told not to make noise, not to applaud, not to cheer. So it really is going to be a focus on just the two candidates. It's going to be a major, major focus indeed. Uh, Dana, the first impressions are important, uh, but what are you going to be looking for? Well, the fact that you just mentioned, it's going to be 90 minutes straight. Uh, in past debates, there have been breaks. He's been has had time to catch his breath. Obviously, on stage with lots of candidates, not just one, as he will be tonight. And so he has no chance to step back. The question is, will he be able to keep not just his energy, but his focus for an hour and a half? And also the question is whether or not he will suffer from not doing the traditional debate prep. Uh, Hillary Clinton not only did mock debates with the stand-in for Donald Trump, she also did it at this hour or an hour from now to know how it feels doing it in the evening. So she did it real time. And so we're going to see whether or not that is going to matter that Donald Trump really just had discussions about policy and, and personality and so forth with his, with his aides sitting around a table. Yeah, the debate uh, hall, the excitement in this building. Anderson, over to you. Wolf, thanks very much. A lot to talk about. Brianna Keeler is in the spin room. Brianna, you're with uh, Tony Schwartz, who, of course, co-wrote The Art of the Deal with Donald Trump. He's advised the Clinton campaign on how to get under Trump's skin. He's certainly no fan of Donald Trump. Brianna? That's right, Anderson. Tony Schwartz is certainly no fan of Donald Trump, and you are advising really Hillary Clinton's advisors in this debate prep, right? I, I have been doing that, yes. And you're not paid. You told me that you feel like this is your penance. This is my penance for having created what has, a man has become a monster, and I've spent 30 years feeling bad about it, and now I feel like I've got to show that there's, no, there's nobody behind the curtain. He's the, he's the wizard who isn't a wizard. But you spent 18 months with him as you co-authored The Art of the Deal. There must have been something that you saw during that time of Donald Trump that was appealing. Honest to God, and I kept a journal during that period, there was nothing I found appealing. Now, I know that sounds extreme and crazy, but this is a man who I really believe lacks a conscience at the deepest level. So there wasn't anything. He's a, he was effective in certain ways. He's a, he's a dominant, aggressive personality, and he pushes and he pushes and he pushes, and he gets a lot of what he wants. Did you ever see a situation uh, that is, I mean, obviously not as high stakes as this, but I'm sure that there were moments over the course of that year and a half that you saw a high stakes moment? Well, what I saw was the way he did business. So, the, as I've said many times before, he, he was a liar then, he's a liar now. So he, he lied his way through many, many different situations, and uh, he, he was able to get a lot doing it. Uh, the problem is, we don't want that man to be president of the United States. All right, Anderson, back to you. Obviously, some very strong opinions from Tony Schwartz, who's been spending a considerable amount of time uh, advising Hillary Clinton's advisors ahead of this debate. Yeah, Brianna Killer, thanks. So let's go to CNN's Jim Acosta. He's also in the spin room with one of Donald Trump's most famous, most ardent supporters, legendary college basketball coach Bobby Knight. Jim? Uh, that's right, Anderson. It goes to how unconventional this campaign has been. Uh, Bobby Knight, the legendary uh, Indiana Hoosier basketball coach, who's also advised Donald Trump from time to time, and you gave him some advice during the debate prep. Tony Schwartz, who co-wrote uh, The Art of the Deal with Donald Trump, was just talking to our Brianna Keeler. He described Donald Trump 
as a monster. Is that the man that you know? <laughs> There's no way I would even pick that uh, uh, name to even be close to what I think of Donald Trump. I think Donald Trump is an extremely sharp man, very smart, a tough-minded man. Uh, I was a history and government major, so I've studied this every uh, uh, election since I've been out of college. I've looked at this person or that person and I've always enjoyed that. And when as I look at Donald Trump, I say, here's a guy that can deal with problems. You know, he's not uh, he's a national figure, but he's an international figure. They know him all over the world. He has acquaintances here, there, and everywhere. And Donald Trump uh, is going to provide us with a great military. He's going to have a much better, much better uh, relationship to all of our military people than anybody's had before. And let me ask you this. You were involved in the debate preparations. What did you tell Donald Trump? You were just telling me a few moments ago before we were on camera that he needs to watch his step a little well, bit. I tonight. think he just needs to be in, uh, in a uh, conversational voice and just talk if if there's something he doesn't like just say hey you know that's your prerogative I just think a little bit differently and what I've seen from him is that that part of his uh, his background the problem-solving part is to me the most important tool in this in this uh, election now there are two things that would bother me from the other side one was Benghazi it'll never happen in a Donald Trump administration the second is accepting money from foreign countries and using it for your own self right. that's two okay. things never going to happen in that administration. All right, Coach Knight, thank you for your time very much. I understand we'll uh, see some live pictures right now of Donald Trump arriving. Anderson, I'll throw it back to you. All right, Jim, thanks very much. Uh, let's talk to our panel. David Axelrod, I mean, you've seen a lot of debates. Uh, have you ever seen anything like this? And what particular should viewers at home watch for? Because you earlier said it's not really the opening statements, because that's something they just sort of get off their chest. It's really what happens after that. Yes, and I think these things are measured in moments, uh, exchanges and moments that are memorable. But the thing that interests me, having been involved in this in a couple of uh, election campaigns, preparing candidates for these debates, this is an incredibly pressureful exercise. And the reason that you prep is because there are so many different variables that could come up, and you want to kind of anticipate as many of them as you can. If Donald Trump uh, truly hasn't prepped in the traditional way for this, it would be an extraordinary achievement to perform well uh, under this kind of pressure. I, I always think about debates, as, I mean, just as someone who's moderated a couple during the primary season, as like a, it's a future game of three-dimensional chess that, you're, you're, that right. you're planning for. I mean, you're planning for an infinite number of moves and counter moves, and you do have to, it helps to practice it. There's no question about it, because given the pressure of the moment, to have to make those calculations right then and there is a very difficult thing to do. And in my experience, the candidates who are prepared do better than the candidates who aren't properly prepare. But if you're Donald Trump, you trust your gut, and you've always been a gut yeah. player, and you've never played on this kind of a and stage it's before. And it's gotten him very, very far and in it's gotten yes. him, And it's gotten him very far. The difference this evening, as we've talked about earlier, is the audience, because he always gets his energy off the audience. Some people would say he makes mistakes when he gets his energy off the audience, but he's going to have a quiet audience tonight. So they say. And, I mean, that's, that's what the Presidential well, Debate Commission <laughs> wants. Who knows what will actually happen? Right, but, and anything can happen, but previous presidential debates have sure. had quiet audiences. Now this is a year unlike uh, I, any I other, but it's going to be different for him. Michael? Governor Pence said in a CNN interview moments ago that his advice is be yourself, which seemingly <laughs> makes sense, but I don't know what that means to Donald Trump. Just a month ago, there was a particular day where he was seemingly presidential when he went to Mexico City and stood alongside the Mexican president. And I took a look at him and I thought, he looks like an individual with some stature. And that very same night, came back to the United States, went to Phoenix, did a rally, and it was the firebrand Trump. Which one shows up in 55 minutes? That's what I want to see. Yeah, well, and, and whoever shows up, can he sustain it for 90 minutes? I mean, that's the thing. No commercial breaks, no bathroom breaks, uh, no phone call to a friend. You've got to stand there and you've got to talk in depth about these issues. It's hard to imagine that even if he's Mexico Trump, uh, can he sustain <laughs> that uh, throughout but, the whole But thing? David, I mean, Donald Trump, uh, you know, was himself early on and a lot of audiences certainly, you know, loved it. Uh, it, it worked during the primary debates. Mm -hmm. What has 
now gotten the polls really close seems to be the new management he's yes. under, which is a much more controlled yes, Donald Trump. Yes, being tied to the teleprompter, right. not ad-libbing as much, not saying as many provocative things. The fact is that he's got the people who respond to that. He needs to win people over who have profound questions as to whether he has the temperament and the, and the experience to be president of the United States and the mastery of material. That's what he needs to show in this debate if he's going to make progress. We're about uh, 40, uh, some odd 48 minutes or so away from the start of this incredible debate. Up next, as we close in on the debate, we're getting new information about where Bill Clinton will be or won't be tonight. We'll have that for you ahead. The following sponsor's content is brought to you by Graves and Epic's original series. We just heard a shocking, unprecedented apology from our former president, Richard Graves. Former President Richard Graves here. Did you ever look back at those misspent days of your past, wondering, what the hell was I thinking? Well, me too. Only I was President of the United States at the time. Sorry, America. What do you make of this, Michael? Well, as if this year hasn't been strange enough already, we now have a former president coming out of retirement to basically say, my bad, about his entire presidency. This is big, Congressman. The damage that I think he did isn't really alleviated by his now admitting it. It's kind of like the old saying, better late than never, doesn't apply in this case. Some of you probably thought I was dead. Well, most of you probably wish I were. Well, I don't think any of us wish that he was dead. Uh, Michael, what do you think? Well, you know, the bottom line is President Graves is not only a great public servant. He was one of our greatest presidents. And I think that's just a little bit hard for some of our colleagues here. <laughs> well, so, I'm not the one who said everything he did was wrong. He did. But, but, but hold on, Mike. Let's get some historical context in here. Former presidents don't apologize. Former presidents burnish their legacies. They don't burn them down. But I think that uh, he has a lot of people wondering, frankly, uh, does our former president have a screw loose? I have a message for our candidates. Tell the truth. Keep your promises. And cut the crap. Michael, isn't it true that voters, they at least say they're craving honesty. They want to see a president address the nation in a forthright way. They do. Honesty is a, is a refreshing attribute in politicians these days. But the question is, is this honesty? And the real question becomes, where does he go from here? What I'm afraid may happen is he may get criticized by the true believers who now think he's betrayed them. You know, it's an unintended consequence of the 22nd Amendment when you think about it. Hmm. We put it into uh, law the fact that a president can only have two terms in office. But by doing so, you, you create a potentially dangerous situation, a politician with absolutely nothing to lose. I'm former President Richard Graves. And frankly, I don't give a damn who approves this message. Graves, a new original series, only on Epics. As I reflect on these past eight years, and I have seen the strength of our veterans. A CNN town hall. President Obama on the challenges facing U.S. veterans and his legacy as commander-in-chief. Jay Tepper moderates Wednesday at 9 on CNN. September sales event is on at Ashley Ford. During SUV season, drive the 2017 Escape for just $198 a month or get a new F-150 Super Crew for only $289 per month. Choose from hundreds of new SUVs and trucks. Then compare and save at Ashley Ford or AshleyFord.com. You have a vision. It's behind everything you do. Even when you least expect it, it comes through. You know what you want, and we can help make it real. You need choices? We've got all kinds including special finishes and papers and they're all absolutely guaranteed because you have a vision and we have your card 500 started just 9.99 when you enter bc500 at vistaprint.com if you or a loved one had an IVC filter placed to prevent blood clots from traveling to your heart or lungs and suffered an injury you may be entitled to substantial financial compensation call injury help desk call 1-800-466-1156 Town Hall, Wednesday at 9, only on CNN. We're closing in on one of the biggest nights in the history of American politics. The first debate between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Only minutes away, the pressure on both candidates is enormous right now with the race in a dead heat. We're live here on the campus of Hofstra University on this debate night in America. 
Let's check in with CNN's uh, Jeff Zeleny. He has new information on where Bill Clinton will be tonight. What are you learning, Jeff? Well, for all the intricate planning that has gone into the Clinton operations debate night, there is still one question that is hanging over many in the campaign. That is, where will Bill Clinton be tonight? Now, he has never been in the audience for one of these major presidential debates that his wife has had uh, on stage. He's never been sitting in the audience. I am told by two advisors that he will be behind stage. He will be one of the last people to talk to her before she goes out on stage for this 90-minute debate without breaks. I am told that he is not likely to be seated in the audience. He wants to watch this in real time without having a camera watching him. He gets emotional watching things, sort of like a sporting match, I'm told, so he is likely to not be in the audience. But he has not completely ruled it out. They are holding a seat for him in case he changes his mind. He could call an audible at the last minute. But for now, Bill Clinton will be backstage advising his wife and not at the front of the house. Wolf. All right, we're also getting new information right now from inside the Trump campaign. I want to quickly go to Sarah Murray. What are you learning, Sarah? Well, Wolf, not everyone in and close to the Trump campaign is convinced that Donald Trump is fully prepared to debate Hillary Clinton tonight. Some are saying they flat out don't believe he's ready. Others are saying they're holding their breath. Now, this is not a candidate who has been doing a deep dive into briefing books, and their main concerns are the tone, but also the substance here. In the GOP primaries, Donald Trump would write down five to six bullet points on a blank sheet of paper, and he felt like that worked for him. So between that and between the tightening that we're seeing in the polls, some folks close to the campaign are worried that he might be getting a little bit too overconfident. It's prompted some of his allies to tell him he could use a dose of humility as he heads on to that debate stage. We'll see. All right, Sarah, the uh, debate uh, is getting ready to start, what, 41 minutes or so from now. How much does this first debate really matter? John King's over at the Magic Wall. Uh, John, give us some perspective. Wolf, if you go back in history, some first debates matter, some don't. Sometimes the presidential debates don't do much to change the race. But political scientists generally agree that the first debate in most campaigns is the most important. A little bit of history. Let's go back in time. 1976, Carter versus Ford. President Ford was unpopular because of the hangover from Watergate, his partner Richard Nixon. Look at this. He entered the first debate down 11 points. In that first debate, though, the incumbent president, Mr. Ford, actually turned in a pretty solid performance. And look at this. He closed the gap in that race. Unfortunately for President Ford, he made a major gaffe in the second debate about Soviet influence in Eastern Europe. But that first debate there put him back into play. I remember this debate well. 1992, the Reform Party candidate, Ross Perot, the economy was starting to come back. President George H.W. Bush desperately needed this debate to change this, 33% of the polls. But people were looking for something different in that year. We'll see what happens this year. Ross Perot is at 10% coming in. He went up to 15% after, stayed in that race. Bill Clinton, of course, went on to win the presidency, but George H.W. Bush never quite recovered there. We all remember this back in 2000 the year of the recount, but Al Gore came into the first debate, the sitting vice president, in a position leading in the race. This first debate, this was the eye rolls and the size, that split screen we'll be watching tonight with Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton on stage. Al Gore came in with a lead. George W. Bush took a lead after that debate, never relinquished it. It was a very close race, of course, came down to the Supreme Court, but that was a big change in the 2000 race. And in 2012, remember, President Obama was favored. He came into the first debate with a big, healthy lead, the Gallup poll pre-debate. This is a Pew Research survey, excuse me. But remember four years ago, that first debate? This guy really didn't seem like he wanted to be there. He didn't show up. He was disinterested. Governor Romney was pretty animated. After that debate, Governor Romney got a bounce. It made the race very competitive. For a short time, conservatives thought they were going to win. We know, though, Anderson, what happened in the end. Uh, President Obama actually went on to a convincing victory. But his disappointing performance in that first debate did shake things up, so a little bit of history in the past as we look forward to a big one tonight. Yeah, uh, no doubt about that. Uh, we are closing in on debate time, some 39 minutes away. Let's talk to, uh, uh, to some of our panelists. Um, Jeffrey Lord, I mean, is, you know, Brianna was uh, talking about some uh, concern among some uh, Trump supporters that, that perhaps he's overconfident or hasn't prepped enough. Um, is, is there a danger in that, you think? You know, you know what this sounds to me like? Two words, Roger Ailes. The, the famous story that he came in on that second debate after Ronald Reagan did everything all the advisors wanted. He prepped and prepped and did all the detail work, and he got up there, and he, he was having a hard time getting it out. And it was Roger Ailes who came in. They brought him in, and he said, Mr. President, stop with this. Stick with your themes. Don't do details. That is the flip side of what we're hearing here when they say, well, he's not prepared in the traditional policy way. What I think they're saying 
is somebody is saying to him, stick with the kind of things that you know and bring the debate always back to that. And there, of course, Mark Cuban uh, in the audience. But, but the difference is Reagan actually knew the policy. He was having a hard time getting it out. The problem that we have now is there is this grading on a curve. And I think it's very, very dangerous. Putin is not going to grade the president on a curve when he's in the, in the White House or when she's in the White House. Uh, ISIS is not going to grade anybody on a curve. And part of the problem is that we have the most qualified and prepared woman ever running against the least qualified and prepared man ever. And so you're going to have them right there on the stage together. And I think it's very important that we don't lower the standard. We need to make sure he, he can't just get credit for being the most improved bigot. He can't be he can't, you know, the, 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 the most improved uh, hate monger, the, the, the best self-moderating hate monger. He's got to answer questions. This is the most difficult a period for America internally and externally, and he's got to meet a high bar, not a low bar. But, but look, look, let's look at the last few weeks, right? Donald Trump has given policy speech after policy speech on child care, on taxes. He went down to Mexico. He met with the president <laughs> he read there. read them very well. While Hillary Clinton was calling half of his supporters deplorable and getting into the negatives and off the campaign trail for a lot of that time. You know, I think these debates, they're not about the battle of the 15-point plans. We've heard Donald Trump's 15-point plan. We've heard Hillary Clinton's in policy speeches. This is a battle for the heart of the American people. And the person who can reach through that screen and connect with that person sitting at home wins. And that's what we saw from George W. Bush, who by most accounts did not win on the policy battle, but he won the hearts of the American people. Oh. This, is, this is part of the asymmetry, I think, that Van's talking about, is, well, we're going to grade on a curve. And the notion that Trump somehow has a policy shop is, is absurd. I mean, he, he doesn't at all. And, and yet Hillary, I think, too much relies on that policy. But I, I really worry, not with voters, but with the media, that, that we do grade on a curve, that we do theater criticism, and not substance. But fear not, Van, because voters, they don't even really think this is showbiz or even a debate. They think it's a job interview. And they have one question. What are you going to do for me? Not how are you going to entertain me or how are you going to offend my neighbor who I never liked anyway or, you know, it's what are you going to do for me? And, and I, I think that's the problem. And if all we do is, is look at Trump's temper, he well, will be. He will be, you know, it, it's not let Trump be Trump, it's let Trump be sedated. And he'll be properly sedated and he'll go 90 minutes without saying anything terribly racist. But he needs to not merely be reasonable, he needs to be credible about the problems that voters are facing. And I think that's a bar he can't possibly reach. You know, earlier, uh, Kayla, you mentioned this change versus the status quo. One of the things that was interesting, uh, earlier this week, the Wall Street Journal NBC poll came out, and they asked this question in July, and they asked it again in September, big change versus steady leadership. In, uh, in the summer, it was 56-41 for big change. It was even in this poll. And there was some suggestion that as you get closer to the election, people focus more on the actual job of president. And that's why how Donald Trump performs in this debate is going to be important. Yes, you have to connect with people, and that's a task for Hillary Clinton, but he also has to prove that he's up to the job. And, and yet the polls have been tightening. I'm tightening. Right. And right. so, I mean, it, doesn't right. that argue in some way against the idea that as we I think get they've closer, been tightening in part because he's been a more disciplined okay. candidate, Anderson. And so, but tonight is the final exam. So, what, so, what, I mean, what, tonight what, what, is the biggest we call, we say test. He's more disciplined. What that means is he, reads, right. he reads the teleprompter better. I mean, like, at a certain point, I think we got to stop giving him credit for standing up there and reading. My, my, I got a kid that can read the teleprompter. That doesn't make him ready to be president. You're, you're, you're sure totally right, Van, but the question was, why have the polls tightened? And I think that's one of the reasons well, why the polls don't There's a tendency for us to, to talk about this race as if it's five weeks out. It's a dead heat. Here we are tonight. It's a big right. night. It's the first debate. I look at it slightly different, which is to say seven states are voting. So for many people, this is it. They're going to go cast ballots based on what they see this evening. And by the time that second or third debate takes place, they've already cast their ballots And maybe in what stone. they see in the first 30 minutes yeah. uh, this evening. I, I also, sooner. I have to ask this question. Isn't it also tonight about why you believe what you believe? I mean, you are seeing these two people. We know they differ on lots of things. We understand that. We've been through this campaign for the last 18 months, and most of the American public understands that they differ. But why? I mean, this debate will kind of mine that, hopefully, about where each of these candidates come from and what informs their worldviews. Because people are making character judgments here when they vote for president. We've been talking a lot about what Donald Trump needs to do. For, for what does Secretary Clinton that, need to do? That's Hillary's biggest challenge. She has, according to people who've counted this up, 112,000 words of policy posted on her website. Right. Trump has 3,000. Okay? But that doesn't Don't pretend mean 
you're not the person who counted all that. (laughs) (laughs) But that's not how you, that's not how you win. You don't just say, okay, it's 112,000 to 3,000, Hillary wins. What people want to know is exactly what Gloria said. What, what, why are you doing this? What motivates you? And because yeah. she's not comfortable showing her, her heart, and I think because she's a woman, and I think because she's a Clinton, people default to this, well, it must be about power or glory or money or ego or fame. She needs to open up her heart a little bit. Very hard to do, by the way, when well, you're standing next to the bear from the you, revenant. You, you, I mean, you know? you've obviously been in the, involved with the Clintons for, for a long time, and, and I think you would speak to, I guess, then candidate Clinton before he would go out in debates. Um, yeah. But you actually, I think it was last night on, on our program, suggested she should write down two names on a piece of paper. Yeah, Dorothy and Charlotte. This is the arc of her family. Her mother, Dorothy, had a Dickensian childhood. She was abandoned, neglected, abused, and yet lived... Well, Hillary has now lived that, that American dream so that her granddaughter is perhaps the most privileged child in the world. And how did that journey happen? And you know what, the, one time Hillary, the one time Hillary has shown real emotion in public was in the New Hampshire primary when no. somebody asked her how she keeps going and she talked about how great this country's been to her and she started to break down and cry. She needs to say, I want every child who's living like my mother did to be able to live like my granddaughter See, I, I, that, I, I, I sort of disagree Trump. only in oh, this sense. Wrong. I think I would write down, <laughs> if I were her, other names. Hmm. Not her family, but other people's families. Standards. People she's Standards. met along the way. Right. And talk about how what she wants to do in the country will impact on their lives. I think well, that's actually what you said last night. You just didn't finish the sentence. <laughs> no, I want right. That's no, because I, I cut them off. Do you, do you remember that? To, to have what, well, what they here's have. the thing. Can I, like, break the third wall here? Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton are going to be just fine. They're going to be fine. They're both going to be rich, healthy, with really impressive families. They're going to be fine. It's the viewers at home who have to but decide. What, what they're going to be asking is, here is, is that, what they're going to be asking here. What Donald Trump should be asking is a version of Ronald Reagan's question: Are you better off now than you were four or eight years ago? Are you better off now question. than you would be? That's right. Four or eight years that's ago. That's, that's a president. great question. Yep. We, did, we had 3.5 million people come out of poverty this year this year under this president. So if, if, if you and want to increase food stamps, stamps and all well, of that. But the, here's, the, here's the problem with that. I, I had a Clinton supporter say to me, hold up the Wall Street Journal and say, look, wages have gone up. They're not to pre-2007 levels. If only we could get this news out, that would be a good thing and voters would come to us. But that's not about. That's not what it's about. How do voters feel? That CBS battleground poll I cited last week, 60% believe the economy is rigged against them. Sure. That is astonishing. That is what compelled, That what, what brought right. Bernie Sanders to the forefront and is what was undergirds Donald Trump being here tonight. Well, but Van, you yeah. can respond to that. We got to go. Good. Well, well, I, I agree with you that in fact people do need to feel like like change is coming. And I think that Hillary Clinton, because there's been this whole fight about personalities, she hasn't talked about her plans to actually make improvements as she should tonight. I, I'm told we actually have more time. So feelings, to matter. <laughs> feelings matter, but facts matter tr- too. Donald Trump comes into this campaign doing better in the polls, but also looking at the following headlines. The New York Times says a week of whoppers from Donald Trump. They counted 30. 31 untruths in a six-day span. Politico counted 87 lies in just five days. They say he averages a falsehood every three minutes and 15 seconds. The LA Times, PolitiFact did the same thing. So it's not just, if people feel something, like for example, Mexicans are flooding over our border and taking our jobs, it's the duty of a leader to say, actually Mexicans are leaving. We've lost a million Mexicans. Mr. Trump's wall will only slow down their departure. Don't you expect That's Hillary fact. Clinton would do that? Well, this I evening? expect and Hillary actually I, lives in the fact base. I mean, but is, is, is there a danger? I mean, I, this may sound like a stupid question because obviously facts are incredibly important and having policy is incredibly important. But is there a danger of her getting boiled, getting kind of too much into the weeds? Yes, yes. yes. we know so, she knows yeah. the facts. She she wins right. on she wins on the wonk basis. Instead, I would counsel her differently, and I would say, search for a moment where you can insert a little bit of levity. Don't be afraid to smile. And we've talked about how the lack of audience participation, if they honor the rules, will benefit her because he typically feeds on the crowds. I think there's a different analysis, which is to say she has difficulty modulating her voice. And if that room stays silent tonight, she won't feel the need to raise the pitch. And I think that'll be a... He can certainly ask, ask something if, else, if all of you policy wonks are so smart, why are we in so much trouble? I mean... Well, 
th that's the argument against the political class. Well, basically, can I, the, I, the just, best and the brightest. Point, though, on your point about asking people, are they better, were, better off than they were four, eight years ago? I walked into the White House eight years ago, so I Thank have you, some David. recollection of this. <laughs> and you, we had just had a, the worst quarter since 1930, economy shrinking by 8.9%. 800,000 people lost their jobs in because January of, of 2000. Right, and, and actually, uh, I mean, and, the world and, today and, uh, is better than it's ever been. I mean, life for human beings on every metric is better than it's ever been. I'm not just talking about the United States or policy. I'm just talking about globally. The great strength that Trump has is that the status quo is not perfect and frankly a lot of people are anxious even those that are doing okay are afraid that maybe their kids won't be doing well so his great strength is to say listen if you don't like the the protest if you don't like the things that you see on television I can make it better but her great strength is that she can actually make a credible claim that he would make it worse if, if you want chaos he's the chaos bringer if you want if you want riot, change agent, what, uh, well, change agent. Well, yeah and so and so so the well, thing, well, her, 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 let me just say her, her big her big problem and you are correct on this her big problem is she's been so busy trying to explain that he could make things worse that she has not been clear about how she can make things better exactly. but her plans if you look at them actually would make things better according to every expert and his plans would cost us three million jobs so that's where <laughs> and we got to go this is where the enthusiasm problem comes in for her and that's also something she has to kind of deal with this evening because as she explains what she would do for you why she believes what she believes she has to get people voters more enthusiastic about voting for her because on every metric we've looked at Donald Trump supporters are way more enthusiastic yes. about him than Hillary Clinton supporters are about her and if this election is more about mobilization at this point than it is uh, about anything else that are about persuasion then she has to get those yeah. people to walk away from this debate and feel good yeah. about That's I think why Hillary what Dan Clinton. That's been yeah. saying is so important. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things in talking to some Democrats, uh, there was a good feeling about Hillary Clinton after the 11-hour Benghazi hearings. Right. They felt like she did very well. They thought she was very competent. And that's the kind of feeling I think they need to go away with tonight. They, they need to have some you-go-girl moments. Right. She's got to give them something to rally there's around and remind them uh, why they like her in the first and, place. And there's also a great feeling about her after the Democratic convention. Yeah. And that's the thing that right. I would look at because she did a great job there and they did a great job of presenting both a positive vision and making the case and balancing in the appropriate way and giving people a sense of, of, of uh, positive feeling about where she wants to lead. There are a lot of clues in that convention about how she could, she should conduct exactly. herself in this debate. She got an eight-point bounce out of it. I can yeah. tell you what I, what I hope but don't know is that in the last 48 hours she's talked to David's old boss. The President of the United States of America has a beat on Donald Trump better than anybody in politics or culture, and he uses ridicule, going back to Michael's want, point, levity and humor and ridicule to take it down. I just want to check okay. in uh, with our Jeff Zeleny who's standing by. Jeff? Well, Anderson, Hillary Clinton has spent uh, really weeks and months uh, going through Donald Trump's record, deciding uh, what she will or won't fact check. But we're learning some new parts of her strategy tonight. Took a couple advisors say she will decide this on the fly, what feels right at the moment. But she has a list of places she will and she won't. One example of a place she will fact check is on birtherism. Donald Trump talked about that a couple weeks ago, but hasn't since. She does intend to bring that up and fact check him on that because that is good politically for her. An example of something she likely will not fact check is you know, something about the Iraq war perhaps, or something about his business record because he knows that so well. But birtherism is one thing, Anderson, she intends to fact check fully. All right, Jeff Zeleny, Jeff, thanks very much. David Oxrod, I mean, clearly that is an issue which uh, among Democrats uh, and probably even independents for uh, for Hillary Clinton does very well. Yes, and I think, look, it works on a number of different levels. It, it speaks to this level of intolerance and divisiveness that bothers some of these college-educated white voters, but it's motivational for minority voters who they need to get out for Hillary Clinton in this election. I just want to make uh, one other point, which is on this issue of preparation, uh, we heard uh, Sarah report that uh, Donald Trump's aide said he's not one to dive into, into briefing books. He's kind of running for a job that requires that, yeah. and he has to show some level of mastery here to allay people's concerns. Can, can I say something about, about that as well? I think there's a sense that, listen, it doesn't matter. He'll have advisors to tell him stuff. In that building, your advisors all tell you different stuff. 
your advisors don't always agree. Which is why so, you have to have good judgment. Which, which, yes. which, which is why you have to actually know something before you get in there. And that's part of the problem that we have with this guy is that there that nobody has confidence or should have confidence yet that he does have that level of, of actual preparation. Listen, homework matters. And I, I tell you what, as a man, let me say this. To see a woman like Hillary Clinton be prepared, do her work, actually uh, put in the hard preparation and have that to be a negative, for it to be almost like, oh, well, of course. I, I, Let me just finish this. It is very, very difficult to become a master of a single policy area. She is the Michael Jordan of policy <laughs> in multiple, multiple areas. And we almost treat it like it's, it's a bad thing. There's former President Clinton uh, arriving. Uh, Speaking of another policy expert. Uh, we'll be seeing uh, Secretary Clinton uh, any moment getting out of the vehicle. We've al already seen, uh, I think we saw Donald Trump arrive a, a short time ago. I think we already, did. Yeah, uh, earlier in the day. Uh, there's Secretary Clinton uh, at uh, Hofstra University. I we just are think just, if, you're, if, you're, if you're a young woman watching this woman walk in here right now, and you think to yourself, the way you get ahead is that you work hard, you do your homework, you get, and then to see her um, actually almost put down right. for mocked being for, and mocked for right. being well prepared, and then to be put up, it's like she's like the valedictorian running against this crazy she's frat boy. Wait, 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 wait. I, I, I just, I, I, I have got to say this, and you know where I'm going to go with this is Ronald Reagan, and the difference between Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter was everything you say, absolutely everything you say. He gloried it literally in reading the Air Force budget, line by line by line. He tried to brief Ronald Reagan on this stuff when Reagan was president-elect, and Reagan took no notes, and Carter thought if disaster all, lies ahead. Seats, this was said of Ronald of Reagan all through his, all through his uh, uh, first term. I mean, they wrote books about this sort of stuff, and today everybody reveres Ronald Reagan. This is not a workable argument for, for her. I can bring you, that back, back to the Ronald Paul, Reagan, Paul. but you're setting the bar too high for your man. Just a little free advice. When you say Reagan is the standard, I mean, then and then this Lilliputian walks out. He's just not going to be Reagan-esque tonight. Maybe he will be, but he ain't. But, but they said that about I, Reagan in the day. I, I think you've set the high too, bar too high for your candidate as well. One of the things we haven't talked about is Bloomberg laid out, you know, what, what concerns voters most about each of these candidates. There was not one metric by which more than 50% were concerned about something from Donald Thank Trump. You. They weren't that I'm concerned Janet about Trump Brown University, I'm weren't excited. that concerned <laughs> about so further is, But the one, the let's, one let's, issue let's, of sorry, concern was 57% concerned about Hillary Clinton Email scandal. Let's listen to what's uh, happened in the halls. We are very pleased that you all are here. One year ago, Hofstra was asked if they would agree to serve as the 2016 backup site, and 68 days ago, they were activated. When you look around this campus and you think about all the work that has been done in the last 10 weeks while starting a new academic year, it is absolutely phenomenal. This is the result of a fabulous team effort. The work on the debates themselves started two years ago, and it has involved an extraordinary amount of teamwork between a lot of large organizations. There are many individuals who deserve particular thanks, and we're going to start this program by introducing the co-chairs of the commission to thank some of those people. I'd like to introduce Frank Fierenkopf and Mike McCurry. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We want to join also in welcoming you here tonight. And this is a, a special night for Hofstra University. They do a tremendous job. And they're actually setting a record tonight. This is the third consecutive cycle where they have hosted a presidential debate. And they do a marvelous, marvelous job, and we're very, very thankful for them. The Commission of Presidential Debates was formed in 1987 when Paul Kirk, who was then the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, and I was chairman of the Republican National Committee. And tonight is also a special night for us with regard to the commission. This is the 20th presidential debate we have done starting in 1988, the general election, and we're so proud that all of you could be here tonight. But we would not be possible to do what we do without the marvelous people who serve on our board, and some of them are here tonight. And I want to introduce them and have them just stand up and take a, a quick wave. First of all, I, I don't know where they're seated. John Griffin, the managing partner of Allen & Company, who's done a marvelous job working with the social media platform people. And I see her, Congressman Jane Harmon, 
and former Congressman Harmon of California, who now runs the Woodrow Wilson Institute of Scholars. And a, a great friend of mine, I've got a couple of grandkids at Notre Dame, uh, it, but uh, <laughs> Father John Jenkins, president of the University of Notre Dame. <laughs> Go Irish, but it's not been a good start, Father John. <laughs> and Dorothy Dot Ridings, the former chairman of the League of Women Voters. Dot. Now let me say something quickly about the format tonight. We made changes in the format a, a, four years ago. And this is very different than what it used to be prior to that. The 90 minutes has been broken into six 15-minute segments of time. Lester Holt will start each of those six uh, segments by asking a question to one of the candidates. That candidate will have two minutes to answer. The other candidate will have two minutes to respond and answer. And then for the next 10, 11, or 12 minutes, depending upon how things go, we want the candidates to actually debate to talk to each other, to challenge each other on the issues. The moderator is also there to make sure that they d drill down on the issues and we get some answers, rather than the old two-minute thing that we used to see in the old debates. Only Lester Holt knows the questions that will be asked. The commission does not know, we have no control over it, and of course the, ca the candidates do. Now the last thing I have to do tonight is to be the public scold. And what I mean by that is by all estimations, there are, could be as many as 100 million people watching around the world in the United States what happens on this stage tonight. And this debate is for them, for them to observe these candidates, to listen to them, to consider what their position is on the issues, and to see them in, in this atmosphere that we have here. It is not, this debate is not for us, the lucky ones, who get to sit in this audience and be part of history, really. And this is a very historic debate tonight. So this is not like the primary debates. There's no clapping, there's no cheering, there's no booing, there's no sound. You please be quiet. Let's not interfere with what those 100 million people are doing in trying to exercise their view of democracy by listening to what these candidates say. You'll get a chance to applaud in a few minutes when the two candidates come out and meet right where I am. And when it's over, you get a chance to applaud. So please, please follow that. It's very, very important to us. It's important to the candidates. And we don't want to have anything disrupting what's happening. And like I say, we've done 20 of these. And only on one or two occasions have we had a problem. So we're putting our trust in you. And I think Lester is going to talk to you about this also. Uh, as I said, Paul Kirk and I started this way back in 1987. And as much of you know, when Teddy Kennedy died, Paul was named by the governor of, of Massachusetts to fill Teddy's seat until a special election was held, and he had to step down as being my co-chairman. But we were very, very lucky to have this gentleman standing to my right. He's usually on my left, but uh, that's another story. And uh, Mike McCurry, who did such a tremendous job uh, as uh, spokesman of the White House for President William Jefferson Clinton. Mike? Thank you, Frank. Our partnership is really a valuable one, and we, we really do work well together. But the Commission on Presidential Debates itself is totally nonpartisan. It's a nonprofit organization. We don't get funding from the government, from political parties, or from any public entities. So we therefore rely on a number of corporations and individuals and foundations that have been really generous in allowing us to put these debates on. And I'd like to uh, list the names of our 2016 national sponsors, the Anheuser-Busch companies, the Howard G. Buffett Foundation, the Kovler Fund, Kroll and Mooring, AARP, and the National Governors and Association. Would you please join me in thanking them for the work that they've done? In addition to putting on these debates, uh, we have uh, this time around incorporated a lot of social media aspects into some of what you will see in the coming debates and certainly some of what you see here tonight. And that's involved a lot of partnerships that we've developed with uh, technology companies, social media companies, and others that you will see listed there in your program. I encourage you to take a look at that and see some of the ways in which we bring the educational aspect of these debates to a much wider audience through the work that we do with these partners. 
And the next thing I would say is some of you might wonder, well, what does the Commission on Presidential Debates do when it's not a presidential campaign election year? Well, we are very proud of the work that we do internationally. One of the things that we have done is to lend expertise to other countries that are interested in sponsoring their own debates. They learn from our staff, learn from people we send abroad to help them with their function. You'll see more information about that also listed there uh, in you know, your, your program. Um, and then finally, I would join with everyone who has complimented our friends here at Hofstra. We could not have done this in the record time that it took Hofstra to pull this together without some incomparable leadership from the president of that institution. It's my pleasure to introduce President Stephen Rabinowitz. The debate is now just minutes away. We're going to take a one-minute break. We'll be right back. This guy's hand in this waistband. Yeah, he's a black male. If I'm only human. After all, don't put the blame on me. We now have more African Americans under criminal supervision than all the slaves back in the 1850s. The 13th Amendment to the Constitution makes it unconstitutional to be held as a slave. Except for criminals. The loophole was immediately exploited. The policies put forward were a use of political force. Federal crime bill. Mandatory minimums. Three strikes. It became virtually impossible for a politician to run and appear soft on crime. It was an enormous burden on the black community that violated core fairness. Called the end of slavery jubilee. We thought we were done then. We get the bills passed to vote, and then they break out the handcuffs. I'm only human. After all, don't put the blame on me. We're just minutes away from the biggest moment yet in the 2016 presidential campaign. Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, they're getting ready to walk on stage for their first debate and getting ready to make history. The first woman to head up a major a party a presidential ticket here in the United States, facing off against an unconventional candidate who defied the odds and won his party's nomination with no political experience. Uh, Jake. Stakes are enormous right now. They're enormous, and, and though Rome wasn't built in a day, each of these candidates has his or her own considerable challenges. For Hillary Clinton, one of the biggest issues that voters say they have with her is whether or not she's uh, trustworthy, whether or not she's honest. Uh, she really needs to, to try to convince people that her motivations are pure. She's not just out for power. She wants to improve people's lives. Usually, uh, Democrats poll better when it comes to cares about people like me. In recent polls, that's been a little too close. For Trump's part, he he really needs to convince the American people that he has the qualifications, the ideas, the knowledge, and the temperament. This is a change election in many ways, uh, and in a lot of ways Hillary Clinton does represent the status quo. The concerns that so many people have about whether or not Donald Trump has the temperament for the job, he needs to start really assuaging those concerns. And they're about to introduce the spouses, uh, Dana. This is going to be in a moment, I think, the, uh, the, the 1,100 people who have gathered here in this debate hall. They're going to be pretty excited. Oh, absolutely. And and not only are we going to see Mrs. Trump, who is, as her husband is, very new to politics, but somebody who is incredibly seasoned at this, Bill Clinton. And I just think it's also fascinating that he doesn't like to be in the room. He likes to be behind the scenes in the green room for a number of reasons, I'm told. First of all, just um, I think it's where she prefers him to be so she doesn't catch his eye and try to think, is he trying to seg me, send me a signal of some sort? But from his perspective, it's because He's so invested in this, he doesn't want to be seen on camera uh, doing anything that you know, he shouldn't be doing uh, in terms of his reaction to what, how things are going. And we saw him walking in uh, with, to see if they, he's going he's to be a Drew's Bill Clinton and Melania Trump. Uh, those are the two spouses of these two presidential candidates. Yeah, I mean, and we talk about how uh, Hillary Clinton is the first female uh, to head a major party presidential ticket uh, in addition to the unprecedented nature. Of, of Donald Trump. Uh, we also have the fact that a first spouse would be a former president, something that we have never seen in this country before. And then after that, we're going to be hearing from Lester Holt, the NBC News anchor, who's the moderator 
of this debate. The pressure is enormous on him. Enormous on him, and uh, you know he obviously has been, as the the uh, debate commission co-chair said, keeping his own counsel. But one thing that I thought was really fascinating, and it's important for our viewers to remember, is that when they start, they're each going to speak for two minutes. But then there will be a time when Lester Holt is going to pull back. It's in the rules, and the two of them are going to actually debate. They're going to go at it. They're going to have ten minutes uh, to go, you know, sort of head to head in whatever way they want, on whatever issue they want. And so that, I think, is going to be so telling as to how they interact with one another, what topics they choose to use, and uh, the kind of, uh, of tone and tenor that they take with one another. And I'm curious to see if this crowd here will remain silent. You heard the warning, no applause, maybe when they're all introduced at the beginning, at the very end. But I'm curious if the 1,100 people here, a lot of partisans, are going to heed that. Uh, advice. That's right. I mean, the, the debate hall here at Hofstra University is full, uh, but you heard uh, the co-chairs of the Presidential Commission, uh, the Commission on Presidential Debates, really admonish them, keep it quiet. This is not a primary debate. This is not a caucus debate. Have respect for the two individuals on the stage. Anderson, we're only moments away from the start of this debate. Uh, that's right. Uh, eight minutes, 30 seconds or, or so. Let's get some final thoughts from our panelists. Just David, in terms of a cheat sheet for viewers at home, what, what are you going to be watching for? What do you encourage them to? Well, I think we've set up, everybody's set up the parameters. How does, how does Trump do in terms of the sort of basic mastery and temperament test? And does Hillary Clinton connect? Uh, those are the, going to be the, the, you know, connect in a very human way and give people a sense of her motivation. Those are going to be uh, the things that I'm going to be looking for. And then, you know, the, the non linear things, the reaction shots, the how someone reacts to an unexpected the moments, the, the, the oh, those yeah. moments that we talked about before, yeah. You know, it's a magnifying glass for them when you when you have that split screen. And we're on a large panel here, not everybody's looking at every time we yawn or roll our eyes or whatever. And I think that uh, this is something that's difficult for someone to master if you really haven't been constantly under that kind of scrutiny before. Donald Trump was on a, you know, a, a panel of 16 or 17 other candidates. Hillary Clinton has been there before. She knows how to, how to do this. And it'll be interesting to see Donald Trump and uh, perform. Yeah. Yes. And how they trying to reach out to particular segments of the uh, electorate, college educated white uh, uh, white women, for instance, for Donald Trump, he's struggling uh, with those folks and Bernie Sanders supporters. I mean, a lot of those supporters are, are parked in those third party uh, slots with Gary Johnson and Jill Stein. Uh, are they going to reach out to those folks? Because that is what I think is really limiting uh, Hillary Clinton's ability at this point to pull away. Michael. Themes have carried him thus far. Jeffrey is right to say that was Roger. Roger Ailes' advice to Reagan in 84 before the Mondale debate, but the rules have changed. And as we've discussed extensively here, these 15-minute pods, I want to see the final 30 minutes. And I want to know what does he still have in his tank to speak with specificity on the issues. If he can do that, it'll be a good night for Donald Trump. Otherwise, it'll be a better night for Hillary. Jeffrey? He's got television skills, and I think that's going to play a real role in this. She does not. She's just been a political figure. I think that could play a role in this, and, uh, uh, I, you know, I expect him to do very well with it. I just yeah, I'm looking for that connection moment. I think uh, sometimes we underestimate Donald Trump. We recall when Ted Cruz had the New York values line of attack.